<clears throat> Daniel chapter 9, and we're focused on the time period of the 490. What I think is interesting about 490 is what day and what month is the Day of Atonement? Remember, no, I'm talking about in the Bible, what does it say the Day of Atonement? It's always on the same month and day. Seventh month. What day is the seventh month? What is it? No. Tenth day. So here we got the seventh month. This is the Day of Atonement in the Bible. It's the tenth day. You know, and I, I'm wondering why, why does he pick that? Well, what happens when I multiply these two together? What do I get? Seven. What does it say in Daniel 9 24, the first phrase? 9, 77. 77 or 70 weeks, right? And so when I multiply this day, seven days per week, I get 490 days. And then we use the day for your principle in Ezekiel, uh, right? 4 6 and Numbers 14 34. We know this is 490 years. Okay. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 18 to Peter when he said, How many times should I forgive somebody who comes? How many times? Right? Matthew chapter 18, is it verse 22? Is that what it is? Will you check me on that, Bill? So in Matthew, Chapter 18 and verse 22. Let's see if I'm right on yes. that. Okay. He says, verse Jesus. Yeah, we'll go ahead and read the verse for us if you don't mind. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 70 times seven, we get 490, right? And what is the topic of Matthew 18 22? Forgiveness. 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 I think it's interesting. When somebody is forgiven, they're released, aren't they? Right? They're released from whatever bad thing they did. They're released from that sin, right? It's almost like they're they're released out of bondage. Because Jesus says, if you sin, then you're in bondage to sin. John chapter 8. Start there at verse 32. And so... I think it's interesting when we look at the numbers here. 490 is an arbitrary number. It actually means something. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 25. Read verses 8 to 10. Two million can be released. Yes. I got something. You got something. I'm released. And you are too. That's exactly right. Isn't that beautiful? <clears throat> the thing about forgiveness is when you forgive somebody else for doing you wrong, it's also a release for you, for, for you as well, isn't it? It's a win-win situation. When somebody wants to be forgiven and you forgive them, it's a win-win situation. So we have a win-win situation with God. What does it say there in Leviticus 25, 8 to 10? You got, you got a bill? Count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years. So that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the Day of Atonement, sound the trumpet throughout the land. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. Leviticus 25, 8 to 10. I love that passage. It's, it's proclaiming the year of jubilee, right? Jubilee comes from the word... That's an alternative Hebrew word for ram, meaning it's focused on the horn of the ram that announces what? Liberty, right? Jubilee. Liberty. Or liberty. What did Jesus say when he went into the synagogue in Luke chapter 4? It says in verse 16, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and then he they handed in the scroll of Isaiah, 
And it's actually Isaiah chapter 61 in our Bibles, starting in verse 1. And he reads that and he applies that to himself. Notice what he says. Luke chapter 4. Do you got it, Gina? 18, I think, is where we start. 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So Daniel chapter 9, 24, it mentions the 490 as the first phrase. The last phrase mentions the anointing, 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 right? And then we go to Luke, and we see in Luke chapter 4, 18, is it 18 and 19, where he talks about, is it the two you read? Uh, that was just 18. Okay, well, in 18, he talks about being anointed with the Spirit of God, and of course, we know that from <clears throat> Luke chapter 3 in his baptism, he's anointed with the Holy Spirit, we looked at Acts chapter 10, verse 38 last time, and saw that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. So the word anointing, right? Anointed one. What do we call that? We say that's the Messiah or Christ, right? So what's interesting about all this is this 490 is pointing us forward to the anointed one who's going to bring liberty to the captives. And he says that in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. I'm going to bring liberty to the captives. I'm going to open up their eyes so they can see. I'm going to save them from their sins. Right? Isn't that what it says in Matthew 121? His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Isn't that beautiful? That Jesus is the Savior. All this, this 490... In Daniel chapter 9, we see the 490 in the Gospels in the New Testament, so 70 times 7. It's all pointing forward to us being forgiven and saved from our sins by the Christ. Yeah. I think about that seven month, that 10th day. Okay. That is a time. <coughs> but what would it be to today's time? September or October. Since they, since our months don't line up with the lunar cycle, right? I mean, how many days you have? Who's got a birthday on February 29th? Anybody? It only happens every four years, right? You're what, you know, you don't age as fast, right? <laughs> so the problem is, because our months don't line up with the liver cycle and the Jewish months lined up with the liver cycle, that's why we don't have exactly the same day in our nomenclature as they did. They always had it on the 10th day of the seventh month. But that, that lands called Yom Kippur, it lands at a different time on our calendar. Right? We have some months that are 28, some months that are 31, you know. A lot of months are 30, right? So that's why it doesn't line up the same. Did you notice this right here? If you look at the math of that, it said, what year is the year of Jubilee? 50. Right? So it says you do seven sevens, right? You get 49. So the first year of, of the next, the 50th year, is the year Jubilee. What happened to the year Jubilee? Let's say you go into debt, right? Um, so they had ancestral land, land that was given to them when they came over from Egypt, right? Your family had a certain block of land. And this certain block of land was all of your family. You could sell a part of it, really you're renting it, because you can't ever sell it. It's always going to be your land, but you can rent a part of it depending on the, these 49 years here, okay? So if you're in, let's say you're in year one, I can rent that for another 48 years, but at the end of the 49, on the 50th year, it comes back to me, right? So whenever, you know, you're renting this property, 
you know, I, I'm going to ask for a much higher price, right, in year two than I am going to be in year 48. Because on the 50th year, it comes back. So this is an opportunity for the Israelites, the individuals, never to lose the ancestral land permanently, right? So in the 50th year, guess what? You're forgiven of all your debts. So on the 49th year, right? I'm going to go to Tim and say, Tim, I need $100,000. Yeah. And then, the older, I'll do the best I can to pay you back as soon as I can. But on the 50th year, guess what? I'm automatically forgiven of all debt. All the slaves are set free, right? It, it, it's beautiful. This jubilee, right, is on. So you see, this is 10 jubilees, right? 10th day of the seventh month, you have 10, you have seven. God is pointing us forward in these numbers that come up over and over in the Bible to how Jesus is going to set us free from our sin. He can do that. Guess what? You sin, you're a slave to sin. Isn't that what Jesus said in John chapter 8? No, no, I'm not. No, I, I, I've had free will. I can choose what I can stop today and start tomorrow. And, you know. Well, guess what? It's not that way. You choose to sin. The Bible says you're a slave to sin. And it takes a deliverer it takes somebody with supernatural power to save you from that sin. You can't save yourselves. Oh, you can change your behavior. Yeah, you can turn away from it. You can say, I'm going to stop that behavior for a while. But is it not still in your heart? Right? Do you still commit that sin in your mind? See, Jesus can save you from that sin. And he can even take away your desire for that sin. That's where it takes a miracle. See, miracles are happening every day. We don't acknowledge them like we should. That's why we have a testimony time coming up in the first week of November. You guys all know about the testimony time, right? Look in your bulletins. There's an opportunity for you to be able to give a testimony to the church how Jesus saved you from your sin. Right? He intervened in your life in a special way. Miracles are happening every day with our congregation, and people need to hear about it. Some people are discouraged. My prayer is getting past the ceiling, you know. Is God really real? Well, he is. He's intervening in people's lives. I mean, the building process is a good example, right? God showing us. I mean, we prayed in church specifically for a large donation, and we even named the amount, didn't we? Sure did. We said 325000 How many weeks? Yeah. A prayer meeting, church board. Our individual prayers at home, in, in our congregational setting. And then God, he sent a check for that exact amount that we prayed for. What is that telling us? That God answers prayer, right? And so we need these type of testimonies. So I, when you look at the numbers here, I love how the numbers work out. Leviticus chapter 25, the year of Jubilee, 490 years years is 10 jubilee cycles scott so so when jesus told peter you know seven forget 70 times seven it's a pretty loaded statement it seems to me like there's so many nuances and overcomes to what he was actually saying there um but my question is what <coughs> in that setting yeah, I think he was trying to say to Peter that, you know, God is so gracious and so willing to forgive us, we should be willing to forgive others, right? We shouldn't be keeping a list of how people wrong us, right? We should be willing to forgive somebody, even, now listen to this, even if they don't ask for forgiveness, even if they don't want forgiveness. We should, still, we should still forgive them. Well, what you also got to remember is forgiveness not only sets them free, but it also sets you free. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Who's going to count 490 times anyway? Right. Exactly. Right. Right. I think that's why you did that. I have a question. Remember when Elijah, I mean Ahab, stole the Nabal's wife? Yeah. And he said, I don't want you to have it. It's my father's. 
but Ahab stole it and it wasn't, did he have to give it back in 15? <clears throat> well, he, he, he was going to get He didn't survive. Yeah, he didn't last. He didn't last, right. You know, that, of but course. But you would have thought that maybe <clears throat> sort of protested two guys out there. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you're right about that. Coventry, England, in World War II, it was a place where they were, even today, it's kind of an industrial site. If you like Jaguars, that's the way we say it over here, right? Jaguars. Jaguars is out in England, right? And so they, they they have a facility there where they do their engineering, you know, with the Jaguars or engineered. Or, you know, they have bicycle. That's where the bicycle was invented, Coventry, England, in uh, 1870. So the bicycle was invented there. It's out in the center of the island of England. And so it was an industrial site in World War II. What did the Germans do? They come over and when they would drop incendiary bombs first, that would light up the city. And then the other bombers would come behind and just bomb and obliterate it. There was a, there was a uh, cathedral that was there since the 11th century that was destroyed by the bombs. The ruins of the cathedral are still there. You can go there and walk through the ruins of it. They kept it as a memorial. But on the wall of this memorial, um, they have engraved in the stone and painted gold. Father, forgive. That's what they have. Isn't that cool? Pretty cool. Scott? So, in my mind, I'm trying to reconcile a couple of things here. So, the 490 points us to liberty and forgiveness. Um, but also, it's a period of probation, isn't it? It is. And, and so, there seems to be a limit that number it is a limited number yeah. 490 is a, a limited number right it's not yeah. infinity right. god is saying there comes a time to where uh you know if you're continuing on in your sin and you're not willing to allow the savior to forgive you you hardened your heart at a point in time to where you're not ever going to ask forgiveness and so this was a period of time for who? In Daniel 9, 24, it says for who? For the Jewish people, right? For the Jews. God gave them a 490-year probational period of time to accept the Messiah and, uh, and allow him to forgive them and cleanse them and save them from their sins and be the people of God that God called them to be, right? And unfortunately, they didn't do that. They nailed into a cross and trying to get rid of it. Right. And so if you look in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus tells a parable about a landowner who rents his land out and um, the owner sends servants to collect some of the produce at the appropriate time and the, and the renters kill the servants and then he sends his son and, he, and they kill his son. This is found in Matthew chapter 21. And so he's telling this parable to the leadership of Israel, right? It, it, look at Matthew chapter 21, notice verse 23. And when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him <laughs> as he was teaching the same, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And now Jesus is answering them back and he tells this parable. So after he says the parable and in the parable, the landowner finally sends his son to collect the dues for the for the landowner, and, and the renters say, oh, there's the son. He's the heir. Let's kill him, right? And then land will be ours. And then after he tells the parable, he's, he says, he looks, he's looking at the, the leadership of the nation of Israel. He said, Jesus said to them, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers, the guys who rented out the vineyard and killed his servants and his son? What will the owner do? And listen to their response. Do you have that, Bill? 41? Yes. If you will bring those wretches to a wretched ant, they replied, and you will rent the vineyard to other, ten other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. So, the leadership of the nation of Israel, right, say to Jesus the proper response. 
Well, the owner's going to be upset and he's going to get revenge on all these renters who killed his servants and killed his son. And Jesus, you can imagine, you know, they're the renters, right? They're the ones that are renting out the vineyard. And Jesus says to them in verse 42, have you never read the scriptures? This is the, the religious elite, right? They're like, what? You know, we're the, we're the most pious people in the land. What do, you, what do you mean? And then he quotes, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is what the Lord, this, is, this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is, he goes on to say this after he quotes the scripture. Jesus talking to the religious elite and leaders of the nation of Israel at that time. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So that's the end of the 490, right? He's at the end of the 490 years, this probational period of time, and they had rejected the Messiah. They had chosen not to follow their king. And so he said to them, well, that's the, it's going to be taken away from you. That's why if somebody says today, oh, the Jews are God's chosen people. Well, they were for 490 years. But God gave them a probational period of time to, to accept the Messiah and to fulfill their calling. Right? You know what their calling was? Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. That was their calling. Somebody got that? Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. That's what they were called to do. Accept the Messiah. Share the good news of the gospel to the world. Why did God put the children of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, there at that location? Because that was the crossroads of the world. If Egypt wanted to trade with Europe, they had to go through Israel. You know, if Egypt wanted to trade with the Far East, they had to go through Israel. It was the crossroads of the world. That's why they're there. And their purpose was to do what? Isaiah 43, verse 10. You got it, Gina? Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. You're my witnesses. You're supposed to share the good news of the gospel, this is the Old Testament now, to the world. And they didn't do it. They didn't do it. Abraham started out good. I mean, they said that long after he was gone, that the people would come through and see that altar and say, remember him. He spread the word. That's true. That's true. But as a nation, they didn't fulfill what God had called them to do. And so this 490 years, which was determined or cut off from the 2300 year prophecy. And I think each one of you had a sheet of paper in front of you now. Did you? Yeah, now's a great time for them to see this. The 490 years is cut off from or determined or cut off from or amputated. We went into detail about that word last time from the 2300 year prophecy. So out of the 2300 years, 490 years was for the, for the Jews to accept the Messiah and they rejected him. And as a result of that, they lost their status of God's chosen people, okay? Any questions? Oh, Scott? Uh, so can we say after Well, the problem is, it's not that God isn't willing to forgive. It's that we harden our hearts when we stay in sin to the point that we don't want to be forgiven. And God isn't going to force himself on us. He'll forgive as long as we want to be forgiven, right? But we get to the point, sin is a horrible thing. We don't realize how it hurts us, how it hardens our heart. Lori? Is there mercy so closely connected to justice? That's true. That's exactly right. In the psalm where it talks about justice and mercy kissed each other, that is the crowning point 
of God's love is the fact that it can perfectly blend those two equal love. <clears throat> It's when your heart is hardened and you're not willing to allow God to speak. That's that's the problem, right? That's God. So, so I guess what we're saying is we are the ones who are willing to darkness. That's exactly right. That's that's exactly right. Notice what it says in Psalms 86, verse 5, okay? I was going to use this in the sermon today, but this is such a powerful verse. Uh, I, matter of fact, this is a life-changing verse, okay? Everybody sitting down, I don't want anybody to get hurt but being blown away. Okay, good, good, good. Notice Psalms 86, verse 5. Bill, you there? You are forgiving and good, O oh Lord, abounding in love to all who call. Okay. Let's hear it in a different, let's hear it multiple times. Okay, you heard it in IV, right? All right. Tim, what do you got over there? You got the New King James, right? Yeah. What's it say? For you, Lord, are good and ready to give and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. That's, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? All right. Uh, we'll, we'll go with the King James now. Okay. Oh, okay. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. It's time for <clears throat> call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things, right? It's a call. <clears throat> it's a call. So notice how this emphasizes God's mercy. It's abundant, it's plenteous, as it says in the King James, right? How, what's the adjective it uses? Abounding. There? Abounding, okay. Abundant, abounding, plenteous. You get an idea that God's mercy will cover anything that you want to be forgiven for. But if you harden your heart, you're going to get to the point you're not going to want to be forgiven, so you don't ask. Matter of fact, one of the purposes of the seven last plagues is to show that the people on the earth don't want forgiveness. Twice it says that they, they refuse to repent. <clears throat> this is during the seven last plagues. So it goes to show that if God allowed this earth to go on forever in this state, people, it gets to the point that nobody would ever ask forgiveness ever again. So it's time to stop it, right? And then the second coming come happens, and that's what stops all this. The earth is obliterated by the brightness of God's glory at the second coming. You, know, you got a frow on your forehead. Frow. Sorry, I was just saying. <laughs> okay, okay. So, I love this idea. The 490 helps me think back to Leviticus 25, the year of Jubilee, and Luke chapter 4, where Jesus proclaims liberty to the captives. This is what this is all about. This 490-year period tells us that uh, there's going to be liberty to the captives by anointing the Christ there at the end of this time period and that's what's so amazing about this prophecy notice the timing of it now we're going to go to we covered verse 24 in detail last time right we just started verse 25 this is where it gets fascinating are you ready okay so let's have somebody read verse 25 now 925 <clears throat> Daniel 9.25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, thus there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. What year was Jerusalem destroyed? That is yeah. Uh, <laughs> Babylonians destroyed it, right? So, Daniel, what year is the is this? Now we have uh, a vision, if you want to call it that, uh, a visitation from the angel. I like visitation better. I'm going to put that down. Visitation 
uh, from Gabriel, right? When did this take place for Daniel in Daniel chapter 9? What year is Daniel chapter 9 taking place? 538. 538. Okay, so it's been almost 50 years, right, since the city's been destroyed and the temple's been destroyed. Okay, and we read the prayer of Daniel chapter 9 in detail last time and saw that he was praying about the rebuilding of the city and the rebuilding of the temple. And so the angel Gabriel comes in 538, and first of all, he says, I've come to give you understanding of this. This is what I've come to give you understanding of. This is what he didn't understand, right? The 2300 years of Daniel 8, 14. And he starts off in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, right? <laughs> By saying uh, the first 490 years of this prophecy is for the Jews and the coming of Messiah. Okay? Now, in Daniel chapter 9... Verse 25, we're going to get into the meat of it. It says, from the going forth of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. All right? So, in 539 B.C., right, right in here, right before this day, the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And guess what? They are pretty good to the Jews. They said, you guys go on back to your homeland and rebuild your temple. We'll even help you out there, right? So they started that process. First, the temple. The first decree was given to rebuild the temple. Okay? Finally, a decree was given to <clears throat> rebuild the city. So Daniel 9.25 says, from the going forth of the command to rebuild the city. When was that given? In Ezra, chapter 7, verse 7. What year is it? It says it's the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Rx, yes. <laughs> Help me out. Add. Uh, R S E S on the end. Artex E R X E R X E S. Something like this. <laughs> <laughs> I have a mental block because of his name for some strange reason. Okay. So Artaxerxes <clears throat> was king of the Persians. In the seventh year, he issues a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. You have the decree given in Ezra chapter 7, right? You can read it yourself. It's there. It says it's the seventh year of Artaxerxes. So how, how does that help us, though? Scott, we know what year the decree was given, the seventh year of Artaxerxes. How does that help us in our nomenclature time? What year is the seventh year of Artaxerxes? You guys said 457 B.C., right? How do we know that? Oh. Archaeology is discovered. What you're told. Yes. What? And you guys have an opportunity to look it up. Don't just take what I say as the truth. You can you can research it, right? What year is the seventh year of our Xerxes? It's 457 BC. How do we know it's 457 BC? Because Archaeology. Yeah, it's a little broad. I agree. Archaeology they is. Found they found letters. Where did they find them? The Dead Sea Scrolls. No. No, we didn't find those until 1947. There was a Jewish colony in Egypt in a place called Elephantine. Write it down. Elephantine. Research it. Look it up yourself. You can see they found, they looked in the garbage, and they found letters written by Jews who lived and wrote these letters at the time of Artaxerxes. What are the chances that we, Raymond, what, what, what are the odds that we're going to go to Egypt 
and dig in this garbage heap of this ancient colony that lived there and find letters written at the same time of Artaxerxes. What are the odds of that? Time to buy a lottery ticket, right? I mean, this isn't a coincidence. This is God opening up the book of Daniel here at the end of time. What does this say in Daniel chapter 12? Close this part of the book, right? Until the time of the end. Well, archaeology comes along and finds these letters. And it's got a double dating system where we can apply the seventh year of Artaxerxes to our understanding of how we do years. And we know without a shadow of a doubt is 457 BC. Why is that important? Well, it says from the going forth of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until when? No, what does it say in 925? From the going forth of the command to rebuild until the, anointed one. Until the anointed one, right? And, until Christ, okay? So let's let's do the math here, okay? And the, the, what what specifically are the numbers given to us there? Seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Okay, seven weeks, right? So we multiply that times seven days in a week, and we get 49 years, and then what is it? 62 weeks. 62 weeks. We multiply that times seven. What is it? Uh, is that right? Yeah. All right. So it breaks it down, these two, which is really 69 weeks, and 69 weeks is 483 years. We multiply the 69 times 7. We apply Ezra chapter 4, verse 6. A day in prophecy equals a literal year. We get 483 years. So it says from 457 B.C., right? I don't know if you guys are ready for this. Let's 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 end the class today. Right? This is this is too powerful. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. All right, 457 BC plus 483 years is when the Messiah is going to appear. Somebody do the math for me. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven A.D. A.D. is Latin for year of our Lord, and that's what we use today, right? So the Bible says, Chris, are you ready for this? The Bible says in Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty-five, that the Messiah, the Christ, is going to appear in twenty-seven A.D. Okay. And what did we say it meant? Messiah of Christ, what does it mean? Anointed. Anointed. And when did when, when did we say, or what did we call that anointing? <coughs> That's baptism. Baptism, right? So when we say anointing, we're talking about his baptism. And we use this verse to prove that. <clears throat> He's anointed at his baptism. What happened? The Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and landed upon him. What does the King James say it did? What does it say? He was anointed, but the whole when the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and it blanked upon him. What's the word? It's a it's a unique word we don't use anymore. A lighted. So, this Holy Spirit in the form of a dove anoints Jesus at his baptism. And the Bible predicted in what year? 538 B.C. that the Messiah is going to appear in 27 A.D. That's kind of sticking your neck out there, right? So here, we have the opportunity to prove the Bible right or to prove the Bible wrong, don't we? We do the math, we get 27 AD, 
Is that the year that Jesus was baptized? Proven. Got, got a lot of yeses out there. Luke chapter 3. You read. <laughs> I want somebody, somebody who really wants to uh, pronounce some difficult names. Read verse 1. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. This is the chapter that Jesus is baptized. Okay, I think it's around, is it around verse 22? That's what pops in my head, but verse 1 tells us the year. Somebody read that. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. And when the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Trichon. Tychonitis and Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Apple. That's pretty good. You did great. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So notice, it's the what year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar? What year did he start his reign? So Tiberius Caesar, Tiberius, he started his reign in what year? He co-reigned with Caesar Augustus for a short period of time. But he actually started his reign in 12 AD. And I'm at, I add the 15 years to that. What do I get? He's matched. You see, we're told by Luke the year that Jesus was baptized. It matches exactly the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. Luke was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. He had spent his childhood studying the Old Testament and the writings of, of the prophets of the Old Testament. I think it's interesting how God chose to give this information to the Gentile to show that he wasn't just trying to make the math work out. He was giving you uh, the facts of the situation, right? And why does he list all these different rulers there in verse 1? To show you that they could confirm the year that Jesus was baptized. You got all that specific information of these different rulers in these different areas, right? All these had to rule at the same time and overlap each other, and it had to be on the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which is 27 AD. How do we know he's, he started his reign here? That's it. Josephus. We can get the writings of Josephus. He was a Jewish historian who lived in the first century. He was not a Christian. And he tells us this information. So we know what it is I said all about. Isn't it amazing how accurate the Bible is? And Jesus appeared right on time. Do you see now why some of the uh, Jew, Jewish rabbis pronounce a curse on their own members who try to calculate the timing of Daniel 9. Because what does it say? The Messiah came in 27 AD. Isn't there a chapter in the Bible earlier that they forbid him to, is it in Isaiah? Well, Isaiah 53 is another one, right? Isaiah 53 is another one they don't want you to focus on because it talks about the suffering of them. Of the Messiah, but isn't it cool that Daniel chapter 9, given in 538 BC, told us the exact year that Jesus, the Christ, would be anointed, would be baptized? And then we go to the New Testament, we see it lines up just right. What did he say in Mark chapter 1 after his baptism? What's it say there in verse 15? What did Jesus say in Mark chapter 1, in verse 15, right after his baptism, he makes this statement. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. I'm here. 
just like Daniel said, I have fulfilled the timing of his prophecy. I'm here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Isn't it awesome? How accurate Daniel chapter 9 is. I love that. We know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus talked about him, the Gospels, is the Christ, the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. I mean, that's just one prophecy he fulfilled, right? How many prophecies did he fulfill of his first time? At least 300. The odds are astronomical, right? I mean, I'm blown away at how much you. Isn't this awesome? How accurate the Bible is? We know without a shadow of a doubt. So notice in Daniel chapter 9 now, it says, from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, or the Anointed One. And he gives those two timings there. <clears throat> it's interesting. How many times, seven times, shows up in the Bible? This idea of seven, seven. Seven times after the ark was closed, they waited seven days. Before the that's a great, that's great. I've got here, I got a couple of notes here about that. Whenever uh, the day of atonement, they sprinkle the blood seven times for the ark of the covenant, right? Uh, we have Jubilee, where we have the seven sevens or seven, the cycle of seven years uh, times seven. Marching around Jericho, how many times did they march around? Seven. Seven days, and how many times on the seventh day? Seven, seven times, right? Um, how about Elijah? Whenever uh, they had the drought of three and a half years, and what does he say? Go look. You know, he's praying for the rain to come, seven, right? Seven times he prayed. Seven, seven times he prayed, right? <clears throat> you know, when I got to thinking about the three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, you know, as a congregation, I think. We had seven different times that we prayed about the three hundred twenty-five thousand. Uh, how about uh, how many times did Nahum? He was uh, this general from the enemy of God's people, right? Here's where it comes to forgiveness too. So imagine this: the enemy of God's people. This is the commander of the army of the enemy of God's people comes to Elisha. Right, and says, uh, you know, I heard that you can heal leprosy. He had leprosy. And so Elisha says, go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And he's like, oh, that's a muddy, ugly river. I mean, no, oh, no, river, river, wow, that's what he did, right? And then one of his men said, if you had told you to go do some spectacular feat, you would have done it. Why not go dip in the water seven times? So he does. He did that one, two, three. After six times, there's no difference, right? Seventh time, guess what? The skin is new. As a, yeah, exactly. Seven times Nahum in the water. Notice in Psalms 12, 6 about God's word. Isn't it cool? The side of seven times throughout the Bible. You know, we know seven is the number of perfection, right? God creates the world in six days and rests on the seventh. That's why we keep the Sabbath day holy because it's a memorial of that event. What's it say in Psalms 12 6? You got it? Tim, you got it? Sure. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in the furnace for purified seven times. Seven times. You couldn't get it any more pure than seven times, right? You heat it up, you clean the dross off the top, right? You heat it up, you clean the dross off the top, and they did that seven times, and that was the purest you could make silver. They, they're relating the word of God to that. How many times do we praise God? Psalms 119, 164. I guess you could guess, right, Scott? Seven times. <laughs> What's it say? Psalms 119, 164. Who's got that? Psalms 119, 164. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Should we do the same? 
praising God at least seven times a day. What kind of attitude would we have? What would that do to our mind? How does that impact our attitude and our character for praising God seven times a day? Right? Right? So this morning, you know, of course, Sabbath morning is a busy time for, for you know, having a spasher, right? And, you know, and I'm just, I, I just want to go over, get up. I want to go over one more time the sermon, right? You know, to make sure, you know, because uh, I have the slides that pop up on the screen. I want to make sure the words I'm saying match what the slides say, right? And so uh, I'm going through there and I'm uh, starting to eat my oatmeal. And guess what? It goes everywhere. <laughs> oatmeal makes a mess. <laughs> And if, what an opportunity for me to say, praise the Lord. If you didn't get on the computer. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, what happens in Proverbs 24, 16? This is, the, this is kind of the opposite of uh, being saved. What does it say in Proverbs 24, 16? About seven times. For a just, just man falls seven times and rises up again. But the wicked shall fall in nature. Yeah, seven times. How many times did Jesus cast demons out of Mary Magdalene? Seven, seven times. Uh, how many times did they eat the furnace hotter in Daniel chapter three? Seven, seven times. Um, how many times does it say Nebuchadnezzar was crazy? Seven, seven times. Right. And we apply that to years. Uh, how many times did Jesus say for us to forgive? Seven times. Yeah. And so it's interesting. You know, that's, there's something about this that God wants us to learn, right? That his mercy, one of, first of all, the prophecies in the Bible are perfect, right? They're perfect. The word of God is perfect. Okay. So I'm, I'm applying seven to perfection, right? <laughs> His, his mercy is perfect. His forgiveness is perfect. His salvation is perfect. He can make you what he has designed you to become. Perfect. Right? He can make you that way. We'll just let him. He'll deliver you from every sin perfectly. He'll cast out every demon perfectly. He'll do this. It's so awesome, the message that we have about our Messiah when we read these prophecies, like in Daniel chapter 9. Raymond. I wanted to get back with you on uh, the numbers. Well, Westmont, the pastor calculated what it would be for 48 prophecies to come through by one person. And that was 10 raised to 157. To 10... <coughs> um, and he said that uh, that is almost inconceivable that that could come true. And there was 456 prophecies that came true. He said with that number, it's you just can't conceive it. Like it's <coughs> as the professor concluded, any man who rejects Christ as the Son of God is rejecting that fact. Proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. It's a fact, isn't it? It's almost impossible. That's just 48 of the prophecies. If you remember a few weeks ago, I did a sermon where I just said if you did eight of them, right? It was a huge number. So we have this information. When we look at Daniel chapter 9 and we see the beauty about the Bible predicted and it came true exactly like the Bible said. We know we can put our confidence in the word of God and in Jesus Christ our Savior. Right? Totally and completely. So any questions about Daniel chapter 9 verse 25? Because next time we're going to jump into Daniel chapter 9 verse 26. I have one question. Okay. Why do you think um, he broke it up into two different times? Seven weeks and 62 weeks. Well, I think that was just a good math. The first thing they did when they came out of captivity, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever the uh, Persians came in 539, defeated the Babylonians, then he's toward the end of the 70 year prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 25, <clears throat> verse 11 and 29, verse 10. It said that they would be in captivity 70 years. 
So 536 BC, you know, two years later, two years from this day, they're supposed to be released from captivity. And and so sure enough, they were, and the Persians said, go build your temple. And so what did they focus, focus on first? Was building the temple, not the city, the temple, right? And so what did they do? They focused on that for the first 49 years, right? So I think it's interesting. It's broken apart that way, too, I think, to show us that we're in a sequence of sevens, right? To, to show us that this is part of a jubilee cycle. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 to 10. All right? So first, the temple. That's what they focus on in the beginning. And then it goes on to focus on the Messiah. It's pretty cool. All right, any other questions? All right. Are you guys excited as I am about this? I mean, when you first see this, you're like, wow, you know, your eyes are popping out of your head, your jaw hits the floor, and you're like, this is amazing. I want to go share this with others, you know? And I think you should share this with others because if you share it with others, guess what? You'll remember it. If you don't share it with others, guess what? You'll forget how to calculate it. So this is a good opportunity with my hand scratching on the board. If you want to take a picture of the board, and go share it with others. And you have another aid right in front of you today, don't you? You have this chart that shows you this broken down in detail of the of how it's a part of the 2300-year prophecy, and it's the 490-year part of that. And we're in the last, we're starting the last week. You know how it's 69 weeks? but well, there's 70 weeks, right? So we're starting the last week of the prophecy there with the anointing of the Messiah in 27 AD. We have seven more years of this prophecy in Daniel 9 to investigate, starting there in verse 26. And that's what we're going to do next time. We're going to jump into the next part of this in 26 and 27 of Daniel chapter 9. So I would recommend call up your, your family, your friends, your enemies, and share this with them. Say, so this is amazing. How uh, active Bible Mark. You going to recapitulate for me? That sounds good. We need to do more of that. So uh, I just want to encourage you to share it with others and uh, maybe bring them to class next time so they can see what the rest of the process is. If this one was fulfilled exactly like it was predicted, then let's see what the rest of it has to say. Right? That's what I love about it. We can put our trust in. Father in heaven, we thank you for these beautiful prophecies in the word of God. We believe it. We accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And he's the one to give us the year of Jubilee. This liberty of being set free from the sins that we have committed in our past. We ask that you forgive us and cleanse us and save us and change us. Help us be like you in character. Thank you for this privilege and opportunity. Fill us with your spirit. Help us enjoy the rest of our church service as we meet together as a church family to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming.